Now that we know what a triangulation is and what the Euler characteristic is of a simplicial complex and therefore of a manifold, we can actually state a very awesome theorem that relates the Euler characteristic of a manifold to the index of a vector field on that manifold. This is called the poincare hopp theorem. And it states the following. If M is a compact connected smooth manifold, and V is a vector field, a tangent vector field, by the way, on M with isolated critical points. Then, what we can do is we can calculate the sum of the indices of those isolated critical points. Let's call them CP, and they depend on the vector field V, so let's call them CPV. And there's a little bit of something to check here. Um, the set of critical points on a compact manifold, because these are isolated, must be finite. And you should be able to prove that using the definition of compactness. So this is finite, and therefore, the sum of these indices is well defined. This sum of indices equals the Euler characteristic of M, which is really surprising for at least several reasons. First of all, we know that the Euler character, so actually even before that, this depends on a vector field. There's a vector field on the left-hand side of this equation. There's absolutely no reference to a vector field on the right-hand side, which means that the sum of the indices, not, the, not a particular index, but the sum of all of the indices on a manifold with a vector field is independent of that vector field. For any vector field that has isolated critical points, they're always going to be equal. Now this, of course, isn't true if I take two different vector fields with the same critical point, then the indices, then the indices of each of those critical points are the same. That's obviously false. You can just look at the example on the sphere, which, let's say, if you take that rotation vector field, so I'm rotating in this direction, let's say. That gives me a vector field, and there are two isolated critical points, one at the top, one at the bottom. And if I take another vector field, this one's much, much harder to draw. Um, I, I won't be able to do a good job. But there is a vector field on the sphere with, which has index 2. And um, index 2 uh, vector fields look something like you take um, the complex plane, let's say at the origin, and you compute the function z squared. And z here is the complex number, so if you take its x and y coordinates, z squared actually looks like the function x squared minus y squared, 2xy, which is actually a vector field we've seen several times in this course, but I never mentioned the relationship between complex numbers. And this vector field, essentially, this is just describing the square. And um, I'm going to do an awful job drawing this, but at this point, it points to the right. Here, it actually points to the left. Here it points back to the right, here it points to the left, and you have to somehow imagine this continuously interpolating. Um, so here it actually points up, here it points down. So you can see that there's like a lot of twisting going on, um, and it's hard for me to draw this. But this vector field actually has um, index 2 of that vector field. So I can draw something like that on the sphere as well, a vector field that has index 2. I'm not going to try to draw it, but locally it looks like this picture. And the indices of each of these vector fields are completely different. And I can actually find a vector field with index 2 that only has a critical point at a single point on this sphere. And there's no other critical point. So the, different, the indices are different, but the sum of the indices of this vector field is equal to the sum of the indices of this vector field. That's already saying a lot from this equality. That's one amazing fact. The second amazing fact is that the Euler characteristic doesn't care about the smooth structure of M. It only cares about the triangulation 
the topological structure of M. So there are two reasons that this is a fantastic um, equation relating analysis and topology. So let's actually apply it to say something meaningful about vector fields on certain manifolds. So one application of this fact is there does not exist a non-vanishing vector field on an even dimensional sphere. Why is that? Suppose we had one. Let's call it V. This means that there are no critical points because it doesn't vanish anywhere. And because it has no critical points, that means the left-hand side, this is a sum over the empty set. So that's zero. But we know that this expression has to equal the Euler characteristic of the sphere. That's, that should be a 2m, right? We're assuming it's of the form 2m. And if you did the exercise from the last video, you were able to prove using the combinatorics formula for the n choose k that the Euler characteristic of an even dimensional sphere is always equal to 2. And for an odd dimensional sphere, it's always equal to 1. Sorry, is always equal to 0. And last time I checked, 2 is not equal to 0 as a real number. This is a contradiction. Therefore, we could not have had a non-vanishing vector field on an even dimensional sphere. That's surprising. This has many interesting applications. First of all, it says we can't choose a basis, a smoothly varying basis of vector fields on the sphere. Therefore, if we have any function from a sphere to another sphere or Euclidean space or maybe another manifold, this means we can't write down a Jacobian in a continuous, in a, in a smooth fashion by choosing a basis at every point. We can only do this procedure locally by choosing a basis locally and then we have to change our basis every time we move to a different point and write a different expression. That's another reason why it's not very helpful to sometimes write um, a basis for uh, a, a, the tangent space of a manifold at a point. Unless if we're doing some explicit calculations such as for example showing whether or not we have critical points of that particular smooth function. And here's an example that illustrates the fact that the sum of the indices has to be equal to 2 on the sphere. There are two examples of different vector fields on the sphere. One of them vanishes only at the north pole. And if I locally look at that vector field, it looks like this. And it's hard for me to draw what it looks like everywhere else, but it actually um, doesn't vanish. I urge you to look at the Wikipedia article that talks about um, this theorem, which is, by the way, sometimes called the Harry Ball theorem. Uh, because um, it's related to the fact that if I take a sphere and I take a bunch of tangent vectors at every point, there's no way that you can comb this without having one of these vectors vanish. So you can't comb the hairs on um, a, an even dimensional sphere. So in this case, we only have a single critical point, and its index is 2. If we look at this vector field, to calculate its index, we have to look at these two different points. And if we look at the orientation on the sphere, and I look at what this looks like locally from above, let's look at the north pole, north pole, south pole, and we have to calculate the index of this vector field. And we better get 2, so we've got to make sure we know how to calculate this. From above, it looks like I take this look at it from above, it's going counterclockwise, that vector field. And we know that the index of this is 1, 
now we got to go from below. If I look at this from below, I got to make sure I do this accurately. This is actually going clockwise. So you might think that the index is minus 1. But we have to use the orientation on the sphere to calculate this index. And I've chosen the definition of the orientation on the sphere so that at the north pole it agrees with the usual orientation. But if I try to move that basis over, that equivalence class rather, of ordered bases over, it would actually point in the opposite direction on the south pole. And you could do that using, you can check using the stereographic coordinates that are in the notes that this is exactly what happens. There's also a picture there to show you how that basis changes over the sphere. And so this actually also has index 1, somewhat counterintuitively. And so the sum of these indices, well, last time I checked, 1 plus 1 is 2, and it agrees with this one as well. And this statement is true for all even dimensional spheres. No matter what kind of vector fields I have, first of all, they have to vanish at some point. And secondly, if we take the sum of the indices at all of the points at which they vanish, provided that they are isolated, then that sum will always be equal to 2.